On this week's episode, we have motivational speaker J.R. Martinez. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for watching. This show is all about giving you insights and showcasing brands that help you to live your best life and give you confidence. As always, I want to kickstart your morning with some motivational advice to help you to feel inspired and energized to start your day. Today, I want to talk about understanding that in order to change your life, you must first change how you think. Think of your brain as a radio that plays the same tapes over and over. The tapes represent our thoughts and beliefs. Our brains are programmed to play the same tape on autopilot until we consciously break the pattern. These thoughts and beliefs that play on the tape are beliefs we've been conditioned to believe throughout our childhood and adult life, accumulated of good and negative beliefs. Maybe that tape that keeps playing is a subconscious belief that you're not deserving of success or not deserving of love. As the tape continues to play in our minds, it repeatedly reaffirms that belief, which ultimately becomes a reality if we don't make a conscious decision to cultivate different and empowering beliefs. Make it your mission today to start cultivating empowering beliefs like I am worthy of love, I am worthy of success, I am worthy and deserving of all the amazing things life has to offer. By saying these affirmations, we cultivate and condition our brains to work in our favor rather than against us. Our brains and minds dictate the quality of our life, and successful people make it a point to condition their minds to work for them with empowering and positive beliefs. As Earl Nightingale quotes, whatever we plant in our subconscious mind and nourish with repetition and emotion will one day become a reality. Stay tuned. Coming up after the break. Yeah, let's talk about Dancing with the Stars. A lot of people learned about your story then. So what did it mean for you winning? Because and seeing all of your hard work and your whole journey come to fruition on the show. I, I gotta be honest, I was uh, a little oblivious to everything in, in the moment. I mean, if, if you've talked to anybody that has been on that show, um, especially if you get to the finals or if you if you win the competition, there's just so much going on. I mean, yeah. it, it, it three for three months, you're in this whirlwind, this machine. And I never, you know, I lived in LA, LA at the time and, you know, I would go to studio t to rehearse and I would see that there was a camera there following us all day long, but I never paid attention to that. I just paid attention to my partner, Karina Smirnoff, and we did our thing. And every time that I performed, I didn't focus on the people that were on the other side of this camera. I always focused on my partner, for the 90 seconds that we were dancing together. That's all I cared about. Mm -hmm. And in a way it served me well because there were a lot of my, you know, fellow contestants that, you know, they spent a lot of time thinking about, oh my God, there's millions of people watching us. Wardrobe provided by H&M. Next up on the show, we have Army veteran, burn survivor, actor, motivational speaker, New York Times bestselling author and Dancing with the Stars season 13 winner, J.R. Martinez. J.R., thank you so much for being on the show today. How are you doing? I'm, I'm well, thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's great to be here and to have the opportunity to, to, to just have a conversation with you. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you. You have such an amazing and impactful story. So let's get into it. You know, your stories about tragedy to triumph to inspiration so let's talk about when you decided to join the army yeah seems like a lifetime ago honestly i'm coming up on you know 19 years since the day that i was injured and it's crazy to believe that it's been 19 years since i actually wow. joined the military mm -hmm. and so as you can imagine it definitely feels like it was a completely different lifetime it was almost in some sense feels like a completely different person but nonetheless, you know, here I was 19 years old, fresh out of high school and thinking about what it is that I wanted to do with my life, where I wanted to go and deciding to, you know, join the military. It, it, it was at the time, it was a full package for me. It was an opportunity for me to give back to a country, you know, that I was incredibly indebted to and grateful for. 
uh, the things that I had in the United States. Um, also, at the same time, it was an opportunity for me to go to college, for me to travel. I, I was born and raised in, in small towns throughout the South. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I've always watched movies and watched TV shows and watched sports. And you see this big world that's out there. And I just, as a kid, remember, I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to experience it. And the military was an opportunity for me to get outside of my small town and go see the world. So it really was at that time in my life, a full package. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I know you got into a tragic accident. So tell us what happened to you. So, you know, I, my military career was cut very short um, and it happened, it was an accelerated process. So from the moment that I joined, I did three months of basic training and then I was assigned to my unit four and a half months after and then I was deployed about two months after I joined. So essentially six months after I signed a dotted line and raised my right hand and essentially took that oath to serve in the military, I found myself in combat at the age of 19 wow. years old. and less than a month of me being in combat i was injured and i was driving a humvee through a city uh, in iraq i was in iraq and the humvee that i was driving ran over a roadside bomb and exploded and you know it essentially engulfed in flames within a matter of seconds i'm trapped inside and they finally pulled me out and you know essentially medevac me and got me to the burn center for the military which is in san antonio texas and i can tell you that that's when the real journey began for me because it, as you can imagine for 19 years of my life my identity was my looks my appearance i mean people came up to me as a kid and would say you're handsome no one ever came up to me and said you have an amazing personality <laughs> so yeah. when i saw my face and my body for the first time a few days after i came out of my medical induced coma for three weeks as you can imagine i just thought to myself what life am i going to have yeah how am i going to be able to walk around in public you know daryl is not going to want me to you know to be on the show because no one's going to want to look at me mm -hmm. people aren't going to want to watch this episode because they're not going to want to watch me and, and, yeah. and look at my face and the scars and you know and then i also you know had to deal with losing the identity that i was starting to create for myself of being somebody in the military being of service and they told me i can no longer remain in the army so there was a lot of um, sort of, you know, I call that day my rebirth. I literally believe that parts of me died on that day just so other parts of me could be born. And, you know, that's the biggest thing for me is the way I look at that moment in my life. But I also apply that to everything that I've experienced since then. Every single one of us go through phases in our lives where something must die something yeah. must leave in order for us to make room and space for the new thing and most of us don't allow ourselves to experience those rebirths because we're afraid of letting go of something that has been so much a part of our identity whether it's good or bad yeah absolutely and I, I like that you said that because so many people attach their value to how they look but you know it could be taken away from them and you know aging there's so many different things that it can be taken away from and really who we are is our soul and our character and that doesn't change right and i also absolutely. like that you said about a rebirth and that you know we do have to whether it's letting go of old behaviors or old habits something has to die as you said for us to be reborn and to step into a better version of ourselves right so I, yeah. I like that you said that i know that when you were in the hospital your mom said some encouraging words to you that really propelled you forward uh, when you were going through a hard time so tell us about what she said and how it inspired you well you know she kept it very simple there was nothing deeply philosophical you know in the mix of me asking the question why which i think all of us ask that question when we're in the mix of going through adversity and challenges and hardships you know one of the things that she said to me was you know i don't know why this happened to you i don't know why this happened to us I'm just, all i'm asking you to do is just try to be that positive kid i was always a little bit of an upbeat positive kid big personality jokester laughing smiling all the time something i just learned uh, from my mother to be honest i think it was partly learn learn behavior and partly who i am and she just said be that kid she's like also just try to have faith that something good will come from this believe that every single day is going to get better and you know the the difference was in that moment again it wasn't anything deeply philosophical or or something that most of us that are watching this right now have to go and google and try to like really understand and think about essentially what she was saying is just focus on what you can control be grateful for what you do have and i essentially just said okay 
I'll try it. I, I have to, I have nothing else. I might as well try that. And once I implemented that attitude every single day, no matter how bad the day was, right? I mean, there were a lot of days that were incredibly difficult and challenging. I spent three years in the hospital recovering. As you can imagine, yeah. it was challenging. My hands were claws like this. I didn't have any range of motion. I did hours and hours of occupational therapy just to be able to learn how to button a button and, and, and go to the restroom by myself and grab the remote and change the channel. So there were a lot of difficult days, um, but I made the conscious decision and effort every single day to show up and just be the best version of myself and just focus on my blessings. And to be honest, that's a mindset that I've carried with me till to the today. I mean, I'm the guy that gets the opportunity to speak all over the world to Fortune 50, 500 companies, universities. I mean, I get the opportunity to do a lot of incredible things. I'm blessed. And people just think that I just show up and I wake up every morning and I'm just naturally like positive. And I was like, that's not me. Yeah. Like there are things that trigger me. There are things that still bother me. There are things that affect me. And I consciously every single day throughout the day have to make a decision to not go down that road and not let that thing to take me down that rabbit hole. Instead, I'm going to pull myself up and make the conscious decision. So even though it wasn't deeply philosophical of what my mother shared with me, it was one of those sort of one of those basic, 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 you know, just life lessons that um, literally can play a role in your life every single day that we should never forget about. Mm -hmm. yeah, I like that, that you, you made the decision to move forward. And I like that you said, you know, that you don't wake up happy every day. Nobody does. I mean, <laughs> even the most any successful person, anybody in this world has their ups and downs. And it's really to make that conscious decision that, you know, today is going to be great. I have affirmations that I say every morning before I got here. I said it today. It's the best day, you know, today I'm feeling grateful to be alive and grateful for this. I'm excited for all the miracles and abundance that's coming to me. Like, I, I like that you said that, that you make a conscious yeah. decision to, it's, it's, you know. it's, it's similar to the analogy that I can leave with your, with your viewers, listeners is it's almost like, you know, most of us, most of us are not in the position where we can just buy the things that we want outright. You know, most of mm. us are in a position where we have to, if you want a house or you want a nice car, you got to make a payment on it, right? You yeah. want something really nice. You probably got to put it on a payment plan, right? Yeah. That's the position most of us are in. But just like that thing that we want, we have to make X amount of payments every single month for a, 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 di a different time, of, you know, for a different period of time, whether mm -hmm. it's you got to pay for two years, for three years, for five years, for 30 years in some mm -hmm. cases, if you want to attain this thing that makes you happy and brings you joy. And I think that's a simple principle that we have to keep reminding ourselves of, of life. If you want to continue to evolve and grow and have success and have experiences and grow and become the person that you truly have the ability to become and, and it's full and entity, then you have to be willing to every single day to make those choices, to make those payments. It's not a one decision, one choice that you make. It's one choice, one decision that then leads you to an avenue of making another choice, another decision, which therefore leads to another opportunity, which therefore, and it's just trickle effect. And so the more that people can start to understand that, yeah, you made one decision, that's great. It's great you made that one decision and we're gonna applaud you for making that one decision and that one choice, mm -hmm. but your work is not done. There's yeah. still so many more decisions waiting for you. That was just one to start the journey. Yeah, absolutely. And look, look at you. You're, I'm like, you're living proof of that. You've yeah. made this beautiful life for yourself. You, you're a motivational speaker. You won Dancing with the Stars. There's, I mean, the sky's <laughs> the limit, and you've proven that. I'm going to get into that in just a little bit, but I want to take it back to when you were in the hospital. I know that the nurse had told you to talk to another burn victim um, and, you know, say some words to him. So what did you say to him and how did he take that? So, you know, this nurse, I was killing time and said, why don't you go and talk to this patient who had just arrived and was having a difficult time? And, and I said, no, I was 20 years old. And I was like, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not yeah. a therapist. I'm not a social worker. I'm not going to say the proper things. I'm going to ruin it. And I'm going to, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and probably put him in a worse place. And she just kept insisting, you know, go in and talk, go in and talk to him. And finally, I just, fine, I'll do it. And that turned out to be one of those examples in my life that um and i'll get to that in a second but essentially i walk into his room i was terrified of walking into this room because he was in a, he was in a bad place and I, I can feel the energy but i walked up to his bed and even though i had a little bit of a pit in my stomach i still approached him i asked him a simple series of questions of you know what's your name where are you from what'd you do in the military 
and what happened and all of a sudden it turned into a 45 minute conversation mm -hmm. and that was probably one of the first times that my definition of a conversation was redefined so mm -hmm. prior to that engagement, I always believe, you know, what a conversation consisted of is Daryl, you speak, you know, 50% of the time and I speak 50% of the time. Mm -hmm. That's not essentially my definition of a conversation anymore. And it started from that interaction. My definition now, because the way it looked is he spoke about 80% of the time. I spent 80% mm -hmm. of the time listening. I only spoke maybe 20% of the time, mm -hmm. but yet I walked out of that room feeling like we had a conversation. And all I needed to do was just put myself in a position, in a place that felt uncomfortable, but just put myself there and listen. And I think if more of us can essentially put ourselves in that in that same, uh, you know, mindset, have that same mindset, and put ourselves in that same position of just like it feels uncomfortable, it gives me a pit in my stomach, but I'm still willing to put myself there. And most importantly, I'm going to listen. You come out of that conversation a better person. And so. What I did is when I walked out of the room, I noticed that he had a completely different vibe, a completely different energy. And I just mm. thought to myself, man, like I really made a difference in, you know, yeah. his outlook and his approach. And instead of ignoring that, which most of us would be like, oh, that was fun and that was cool. That was a good experience. That's a good feeling to just keep it moving. Instead, I went and asked the head doctor of the burn ward. I said, hey, can I visit patients in between my own appointments every day? Oh. He said, he said, yeah, that'd be great. You're the only one that can relate to them. We can't. And so I, that's what I did every late afternoon into the evening. I just walked around. I knocked on doors. I didn't know what I was going to say. I didn't know who was in the room. I didn't know what tone they had. I didn't know how they felt, how the day went, but I still put myself in that position. I listened and I essentially put myself there. And what that did is it introduced me to the very thing that I had lost mm -hmm. because of my injury. I had lost the ability to serve in the military and to be of service. And that was my purpose. Yet by visiting these patients, I realized, oh wait, I can still serve. I can still fulfill my purpose. It just looks very different than what I thought it was gonna look in the military. And I just kind of put my head down and just kept doing it. And then from that, people started asking me to be involved in the nonprofits and help and raise awareness for veterans issues and their families. And then from that, people said, we want for you to come and speak. And every, almost every single one of those moments, I was like, no, 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 I'm not doing that. No, I'm not doing that because <laughs> yeah. Growing up, that wasn't what I thought I was going to be able to do. You don't see people that growing up saying they want to be a motivational speaker when they grow up, right? That's usually not what you hear as a profession of choice. And so I just kind of thought like, no, I don't have the ability to do those things. I'm not going to essentially do those things. But because I kept just trusting and paying attention to the people around me from that nurse, from the first person that said, go and join this nonprofit. I think you can be of service to them to the moment that someone said, I want you to come and speak. And a person that said, no, you should literally try it. Go try speaking. I guarantee you, you'll be surprised. To the point of me, someone saying, go audition to become an actor on a soap opera called All My Children. Someone literally encouraged me, hey, Dancing with the Stars, that thing, you should like look into that. So my life has almost been guided by, you know, sort of the universe and people and God and just all these things that have been put in my way that I don't ignore and I pay attention to. But it's all because I'm willing to listen and pay attention and trust that at the end of the day, there's a reason that dialogue is being shared with me. I should pay attention to that. Wow, that that's uh, that's very profound. The two things that I like that you said is that, you know, listening, I think that's so important is because I think when we talk to someone, we automatically just want to do all the talking and yeah. you don't learn anything when you talk, right? You're just repeating yeah. things, you know, but when you listen, that's really when you learn. So I love that yeah. you said that. I think that's an important lesson. And I do like the fact that you said that, you know, like when you first went into the military, you wanted to serve and now you're serving in even a bigger way. You're serving yeah. as a, a beacon of light and inspiration to the world. So, uh, wow, when you said when you were talking about that, it kind of gave me goosebumps because I believe in the law of attraction, the universe, all of those things. So it's pretty profound that it's come yeah. full circle and, for you. <laughs> yeah. And, and listen, to circle back on that listening component, you know, if, if most of us are trying to listen, and unfortunately, again, I'm not going to say everybody because that's, I think, where we get into our, get ourselves into trouble when you start to label everybody does yeah. this. Um, but most what we, what we find ourselves doing is we're listening, but we're listening to respond. Mm, we're not listening yeah. to understand. Right. Most of us are very, we get very defensive because most of the time, if someone's telling us something about ourselves, we become very protective and defensive because they're triggering some things and they're tapping into potentially some underlying insecurity. 
And for a very long time, that was my issue. That a minute that somebody started to say something to me that was giving me constructive criticism, I perceived it as haters. I perceived it as somebody that didn't want me to succeed. I perceived it as them mm -hmm. trying to oppress me. When all reality, now that I'm mature and I'm, I'd like to believe I'm more mature and I like to believe that I have more insight, I can look back at that period of my life and realize, man, if I would have just paid attention a little bit more, you know, to as few of those things, maybe I would have saved the hardship of going down this road or that road, but I spent too much time listening to respond. But wait, you said that, Daryl, hold on. And it's like, well, yeah, yeah. you didn't listen to understand me. And I think if we can practice listening to understand, then I think that we are able to essentially bring communities together and, and, and people together that maybe haven't been able to have that dialogue. and maybe get somewhere. Yeah, I, I love that. And I completely agree. Um, I want to talk about the impact you've made, um, the moves you've made. Uh, as you said, you've been an actor. Um, you've done so much. You've written books, bestselling author, New York Times bestselling author. And as well, yeah, let's talk about Dancing with the Stars. A lot of people learned about your story then. So what did it mean for you winning? Because and seeing all of your hard work and your whole journey come to fruition on the show. <laughs> I gotta be honest, I was uh, a little oblivious to everything in, in the moment. I mean, if, if you've talked to anybody that has been on that show, um, especially if you get to the finals or if you if you win the competition, there's just so much going yeah. on. I mean, yeah. it, it, it three, for three months, you're in this whirlwind, this machine, and I never, you know, I lived in LA, L LA at the time, and you know, I would go to studio t to rehearse, and. I would see that there was a camera there following us all day long, but I never paid attention to that. I just paid attention to my partner, Karina Smirnoff, and we did our thing. And every time that I performed, I didn't focus on the people that were on the other side of this camera. I always focused on my partner for the 90 seconds that we were dancing together. That's all I cared about. Mm -hmm. And in a way it served me well, because there were a lot of my you know, fellow contestants that you know, they spent a lot of time thinking about, oh my God, there's millions of people watching us. Oh my God, what if I do, oh my God, what if, and again, goes back to, I just focused on what I can control. And what I could control was my routine with my partner. That was it. And so mm -hmm. I just leaned in with that approach, with that mindset. And it literally led me to this place of being crowned the winner of season 13. And I could tell you that the minute that it happened, I, I was just in disbelief because Here's the thing. I was going up against a Kardashian, Rob Kardashian. Yeah. There was there was a part of me in the back of my mind that felt like, man, even though I've gotten a lot of fan votes and supporters, I don't know if I can get more fans and supporters than the freaking yeah. Kardashians. It's the Kardashians. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like all they got to do is send out one tweet, one DM, one Instagram post, and they get like millions of people yeah. to vote. <laughs> and I just thought, am I going to get more people than this guy, Rob Kardashian? And I did. And I just think that what it does is speaks to this element of, I was just authentically myself. I didn't try to be anybody else. I didn't try to, you know, to woe people. I just showed up and I just was myself. I was being authentically who I am and who you'll run into at the grocery store, who you'll run into at the airport. If you watched me on that show and you met me outside, you'd be like, yep, that's JR. That's the same dude. There's, yeah. there's nothing that has really changed about him. Besides, hopefully you don't catch me in having a moment and having a day. <laughs> but for the most part, I'm the same dude. And it's just, it was a blast to be on that show. I loved it. I would do it again in a heartbeat. I really nice. would. And, um, you know, it was really cool. You know, I remember once I started traveling after the show is when I started seeing the impact that I had on that show. Because now you're in, in front of people. The people that watched you, that were watching through that camera that you ignored for three months, now I'm being exposed to those people. And I remember the first time going to New York City and I was hanging out with my, my wife and, you know, just kind of taking some time just to walk around the city and just enjoy it. And, uh, and I just, one person spotted me and called me out and then all of a sudden there was a flock of people around me wow. in the middle of um, the meatpacking district. And, and, and it was like, what's happening? Because before I was on dancing, I could walk anywhere. And for the most part, no one really recognized me, even though I was an actor on the show for three years. Mm -hmm. But dancing put me on a whole nother level. I remember when I went to Canada for the first time, I was like, Canada, like no one watches the show up here. 
here. I'm gonna be <laughs> fine. And I landed in Canada and I was all over Canada and people were just left and right coming and showing me love and they watched the show and they knew of my story. And it's, it, and it was, again, I, I am just always in awe, even till this day, even though it's been 11 years since I was on that show, that people will still come up to me and say, I watched you and I rooted for you or I voted for you or whatever. And um, it's just one of those good feelings that you know you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's what makes you special too, is that you're authentic to yourself. You're not trying to yeah. be someone else. You embrace who you are and it shows. And I think when people do that, you know, it, it, people gravitate towards you because, I mean, that's the ultimate goal in life, right? Is to be authentically who you are, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, and it's so hard. It's hard. To, it's hard to do that in this world, yeah. in, in this in this time that we live in. When we're looking at other people, we're seeing what people post, we're seeing what people wear, we're seeing what people say, and we want to start to emulate those things because we think, well, it works for them. It should work for us. So I'm mm -hmm. going to post photos, or I'm going to say certain things, or I'm going to do something that's going to give me the same amount of attention that is given to this other individual, and it doesn't work. And you spend so much energy and time trying to replicate someone else's model when at the end of the day, you should really kind of do some soul searching. And that's been hard. Listen, social media is a difficult, a difficult beast. And, you know, I'm the first one to tell you that I don't do well with social media. I, I mean, I post and I try to interact and my team tells me I need to be better about it. And I should have more followers than I have, yeah. like on Instagram. And I just like, I just... I, I'm going to, I'm going to go at my pace and I'm going to go at what I feel I can give people through social media. I'm not going to try to be anybody else. I'm not going to look at somebody else that has a similar story or similar experience and maybe has half a million followers and be like, oh my God, why don't I have that many followers? There's probably a lot of reasons, but at the end of the day, that's not my journey right now. It's okay. And so I think you just have to really stay authentically true to yourself and you know, just know that what you're doing is impacting people, whether it's in my case, I don't know what I, I don't know, 18,000 people I have on Instagram that follow me, 18,000 people, right? That's not a million compared to some of my friends. I don't care. I got 18,000 people that follow me because they believe in me for some reason. And I share something that impacts them every single day. So I can sit here and focus on the 980,000 people that don't follow me and trying to get them or I can focus on the 18,000 that actually do follow me for a reason and, and give me their time and energy and give them content that they can relate to. And then from that, it'll trickle into getting the other 980,000. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, social media is such an interesting thing, right? You see people with millions of followers and we aspire to be like them, but really, I think it's really having impact in real life. That's what's actually the most important. Yeah. What's the point of having millions of followers yeah. and, you know, and people not liking you for authentic reasons, opposed to yeah. really having an impact and like you do. So I, I think the whole social media, even though I'm a social media influencer, <laughs> um, I am, but I, I don't put my value based on my followers. You know, right. I know they're and just that. that. And, and that's and that's the fine line you got to walk and you got to walk it well and it sounds like you do it and you can that can be your profession and that can be what you do for a living and you can be very good at it and that's fine but again you're not going to compromise who you are what your beliefs are what your value are you're not going to yeah. make decisions in your personal life based on sort of someone else's algorithm and yeah. you just got to stay true to you and, and what your outline your blueprint is and i and i love that you know you you're openly accepting like yeah i'm a social media influencer but i'm also somebody that's not going to compromise who i am yeah absolutely i remember when i first started my career i used to turn around and look at what everyone else was doing in my field like other journalists and it really slowed me down in the beginning and it would depress me because i would see other people making moves and i was like okay i'm not and then the yeah. day i made a decision to okay i'm going to stay in my lane i don't care what anyone else is doing i'm not even going to look on their page I actually, my career skyrocketed and yeah. yeah, here we are today. It's just, it's good not and, to compare and, yourself, you know? And I don't want, I don't want people to, 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 that are watching this or listening to this to, to, to be like, well, JR, it, it's good to, you know, look at other people. It's good to see what they're doing so you can kind of get an idea. And I, and I agree with that. I completely agree with that. There have been times where I'm looking at other people's page that either my friends or people I admire and I'm like, oh, wow, look how they did that. That's really cool. That's creative. I, I can't do that right now because I'm busy doing some other stuff, but that's something I'm going to keep. Room. So that's fine to be inspired by other people's work mm -hmm. and their content that they create, the way that they distribute it. 
that's fine. But what I'm getting at is like, don't start all of a sudden your worth is defined by yeah. a likes and followers and the amount of people that engage their content. That's focus on you. Don't your worth should not be gauged on that. That's where I say we got to pump the brakes so we have to have a better relationship because, you know, listen, it's not unhealthy to have social media. It's not yeah. unhealthy to engage in it. It's like anything else. It's not unhealthy to be in relationships. It's not unhealthy to to have a drink or two. You know, you just everything is about what how are you going to approach it in a in a in a healthy, productive, mature way. And I think that's the thing that we're trying to get at. Is psychologically, we should all be in a healthier place before we start to engage with certain things. That's anything. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do agree with you. Looking at people's profiles and being inspired is always a great thing. But as long as you don't internalize it and compare yourself and say, why am I not here and all of that, right? Yep. It's, it's more yep. to be motivated and say, you know yep. what? I'm going to get there too, <laughs> you know? Oh, um, I see what I see. There's potential. Like yeah. Daryl just told me she's a social media influencer. Instead of me envying the fact that you do that, I'm curious, how do you do that? Tell me more about this career that you're in right now. Tell me yeah. about that. Oh, maybe. Oh, so there's an opportunity where I maybe I could do something like that. Oh, that's fascinating. All right, cool. Let me explore that a little bit more. That level of curiosity is dope. The, exactly. When you start working from a place of envy and and that's when you start getting into dangerous areas. Yeah. Just be curious and show love. It'll come back to you. Absolutely. And you know, looking back on everything that you've experienced you know, what's one thing you've learned in life? Like what's one valuable lesson you've learned? And what's one valuable lesson you learned about yourself? Woo, that's a, that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a really good question. And one of those questions that made to, to seem, seem basic, but, but to be honest, is not one that we spend enough time with, you know, thinking about and answering. And I think that even myself, apparently, I need to spend more time thinking about that. Um, as far as one thing that I've learned about myself um, is that I am capable of doing a lot of things and I'm capable of being thrust into different spaces and I don't want to say excelling but but finding ways to make it work listen I I was you know we talked about my military career and what happened to me but I was born single mother my father left when I was a baby um, I witnessed my mother be a victim of domestic abuse. I, w I grew up in some really impoverished areas. We didn't have a lot. And I, f I had a really difficult time in my youth and my childhood fitting in. School was not something I was really great at. And here I am, you know, I've had the opportunity to cross into the entertainment space. And, you know, I guess you would consider it to have some success. I've had mm -hmm. the opportunity to write a book and it became a New York Times bestseller. I'm currently in the process right now of um, the next two months, I will complete my college degree. Mm -hmm. I'm in the process of going to school and I've been, pr I've proven to myself, I'm married, I have two children, you know, it's not perfect, but we have a beautiful life and we work at it every day. And I just think that, you know what, I've proven to myself, I'm capable of breaking old cycles and creating new ones, healthier ones for me and for my kids and my family. Um, and as far as something that I frequently live by, I think I just frequently live by this attitude of focus on what you can control. And I think that is so important, you know, in the last two years of, you know, our world was shut down and we had life taken away from us. And a lot of events that I normally would be in person canceled naturally, and I get it. But instead of me panicking about that, I just stayed calm and I just said, you know what, I can only focus on what I can control. And so what I did, Daryl, instead of worrying about, oh my God, the 30 events that I had this year got canceled, what am I going to do for income? I luckily just kind of pivoted and said, you know what, I'm going to use this time to do something I've always wanted to do. I'm going to start a podcast of my own. Mm -hmm. I'm going to figure out this technology stuff, this little thing here, <laughs> this camera. <laughs> How can I figure this technology thing out so that yeah. way maybe we can do this stuff virtually? And sure enough, when once events got comfortable and they were like, hey, Jared, are you comfortable logging on to Zoom, Skype, Microsoft Teams? Are you? Do you have good lighting? Do you have good sound? Do you have good internet connection? And I was like, I got it because <laughs> I focused on what I could control, not the fact that I lost business. I started pivoting on how, fig how to figure out how to be innovative and how to still connect with people using the very thing that most of us have in our homes, technology. 
I love that. Focusing on what we can control. I think that's what leads to a lot of suffering, right? Is when you yep. focus on what you can control and then you dwell on it and you feel pain, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that, that will save a lot of uh, people's heartache if they can just focus on what they can control and what they can do to, you know, make changes. I like that you said that. And, you know, I created this platform to inspire, to motivate, to showcase anything's possible. Um, if you have a vision and you have the work ethic. So for someone going through a difficult time, uh, maybe going through a life changing event um, where, you know, they're having a hard time coping with change. What would you say to them to uplift and inspire them? The biggest thing I would tell you, and you hear this a lot, you're not alone. You're not the only, you're not the first one. You're not the last one to make the change and go through what you're going through, to feel what you're feeling, to experience what you're experiencing. So know that there are a lot of people that have gone through what you've gone through and have made it out on the other side. The second thing, and probably one of the most important things as well, is that you know we live in a society where we feel we love to say, I did it myself. I did it by myself. Nobody helped me. And the reality is you can't get anywhere you want to go without the help of somebody else. And I learned that the hard way. You know, here I was trying to navigate after I was injured the world and society and all I was doing was just spinning my wheels because I was an angry kid and and eventually my what my best friend literally came and hugged me told me he loved me told me just hey man it's okay and he just supported me and encouraged me and then I've been able to find people over the course of my life that have just been there to support me I'm in a business right now where uh, people take energy from me I give so much of myself to people and so it's important for you to find people in your life that replenish that they give yeah. you something back mm -hmm. and so for me I just realized for so long I was just trying to do it all by myself I'll go out there and speak in front of 5,000 people give them all of my energy I can come home and I can take care of my family and I can do this and I can do that and I'm good I don't need anybody and I'll sleep four hours and I'm all right and the other day, Daryl, matter of fact, the other day, I went and got this massage and it was, it was dope. And it was like this mas massage therapist and she's like really spiritual and she's talking and she gives me a card and she gives me this deck of cards. I pulled one out and it said a leg up and it had a picture of a polar bear and with a baby polar bear on its back holding on. And she read the description for this particular card and she said, what this means is that you can't do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. You're trying to do it by yourself let go delegate trust other people bring people into the equation to help so they can help you and even though i know this because i literally just said it to you and your listeners i still had to be reminded of that mm. and so for me it was like oh yeah instead of me telling my wife i got it i'll do everything i should say when she says you want me to help you i should be like yeah that'd be great thank you yeah <laughs> it's, it's it. so true it's so true uh there's so many things that you said that resonated with me it's it's you know you can't do everything yourself and when you try to you'll, you'll be miserable i always say teamwork makes the dream work because right. everybody helping really helps in the end and you get to celebrate together i mean of course you have to first take action but when you have like other people helping and celebrating you it, it really helps and another thing um that i agree with what you said is that yeah just admitting that just basically telling people you need help i think that's that's really important so yeah yeah thanks for sharing that <laughs> of course of course absolutely listen i mean from a mental health standpoint as i alluded to a little bit earlier when i was a kid i mean i i told my mother i'd think about getting into a car accident because i wanted to see how many people actually cared about me wow. i wanted to see how many people would actually show up at the hospital i felt incredibly isolated i felt like no one outside of my family cared about me on that level and listen the power of the mind the mind is a beautiful thing whether you feed it something positive or negative right it's a beautiful thing and you just got to be careful what you feed it because 16 years old i told told this to my mother where three years later i got into a car accident in the military but i got into a car accident right then i found out how many people showed up two months into my recovery i told my mother one day just goofing off i was like one day i'm gonna be on a soap opera Five years wow. later, I was on a soap opera, right? Be, 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 be willing to say the most craziest things and throw it out there in the world because, you know, you, you can manifest it. You really can. But along the way, you have to be willing to pay attention to these different signs, make those choices, make those decisions. So when the opportunity presents itself because you manifested it, you're ready to take advantage of it. You can't just sit here and say, I want to manifest that I'm going to be a CEO 
But all I'm going to do is just sit in my house all day long. All I'm going to do is turn down every opportunity that gives me an opportunity to learn and grow and evolve. That Well, you're not going to be a CEO like that. You got to be willing to take some chances, right? You got to be willing to fail at a few things. I've, I've, I've failed at a couple of things, actually. And so for me, I just want people to understand that you can look at me and you can say physically he's been through a lot. Physically, his, his recovery was difficult. But I equally want you to know that mentally and emotionally, it's still difficult till this day. But I still show up every single day because I have been proven that if I just stick with it and if I, if I implement these different things, I'm, I'll continue to be a survivor. And that's what the potential that every single one of us have, as long as we're willing to believe that. Wow, GR, you're such an inspiration. Thank you so much for being on the show today. It's been so enlightening. And honestly, one thing I have to say that I did notice about you uh, is that you're very present, which I really, that's something I can learn from. It's something that I'm going to leave today being like, okay, I need to be more present. You're very present. And um, yeah, it's very admirable. Like just oh, being present you. in the moment. I feel like, you know, in, in today's society, everybody is scrolling through their phones, someone's talking to them or they're thinking about something else. You're very present and focused. And like when you're talking to someone, it's just you and them. And yeah, it's uh, it's really amazing. <laughs> I learned well, that today well, from you. <laughs> well, well, thank you. And I'm glad that you felt that for me because I mean, I, I believe that every interaction that I have with every human being, whether it's the, the one and only time or if it's a repeated interaction that I may have, it may be the only time I interact. I don't know. I don't know where life takes you or me or your listeners. And so for me, I just try to be as present as I possibly can um, because I hope that that people will able to take something away. If I'm distracted by looking at my laptop and I'm like, oh, I got to email. <laughs> Like, what is that? Okay, cool. Oh, I got an, oh, this over here notification just told me I got a Instagram. You know, someone tag me? What is that? You know, if I'm doing that, I'm missing the opportunity. And so for me, I'm like, that stuff can wait. In this moment, you have been courteous enough and to say, I want to give JR some of my time. And, and why am I going to disrespect that? Like, you, you are here with me. Your listeners are here with me and with us. I got to, I got to respect this process and I got to respect the fact that there's human beings having an opportunity to, sh to, to, to share dialogue and um, you know, that's exciting. And you know what? I hope that one day our paths will cross and maybe we break bread together and whatever. But nonetheless, at the end of the day, I just, every interaction is important to me because you never know what you may say to an individual that's going to help them through whatever it is that they're possibly going through that they're mm. not going to share with you because they don't know you or they don't trust you or they think they got to go through it alone. Mm. That's that's sort of the mindset I, I, I approach every conversation with. Well, you definitely have a winning mindset. I know that our, our viewers are going to be so thrilled to hear your story. It's, it was really inspirational and you just have such a great mindset. And I think so many people can learn from that. Um, just, you know, you've really managed to make the most of your life and it's, it's yeah, inspiring thank yeah so thank, thank you. you so much thank you for thank being on the you. show tag tv is available on roku amazon fire tv apple and android tvs as well as on apple and android phones watch us live through youtube and facebook hey, you can fly higher than this.